stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in
The waters that keep rising up, the floods that call. Put your hope in the Lord, put your hope in the Lord. He will lead us all the way. The kingdom is coming. We are praying for it. The kingdom is coming. We are waiting for it. Churches, all you kings, come and join the work. He's restoring all things. Put your hope in the Lord. Put your hope in the Lord. He will lead us all the way. The kingdom is coming. We are praying for it. The kingdom is coming. We are waiting for. Knox Presbyterian Church, good morning. It's good to see you all. Uh, this is a community that's choosing to express its faith in God through self-giving love, the way that Jesus demonstrates for us. And these days we're learning uh, very particularly what that looks like for us as a church, to express our faith through self-giving love. I just need you to know uh, that you by being created in the image of God, have worth, you are valuable, and just by being who you are, you belong here. I'm thankful that we get to worship together this morning. Um, really thankful that the Reverend Katie Stark is here to preach for us today. Katie has preached uh, for us at Knox before. Um, you're going to hear a familiar sermon in a, around a familiar text today. Uh, as Katie has been invited here to not only preach for us today, but also to lead our congregational 
conversation following worship. These are conversations that we are having more intentionally and more regularly these days, specifically about what's going on with uh, the best stewardship of our building, of this land, and the future of our church. These have been really exciting conversations and have also been filled with questions. Uh, and so we get to bring our questions and get to bring our excitement and all of that uh, as we uh, finish worship today and go downstairs for a conversation. There's going to be pizza, and someone brought a salad. Great for, yeah, great. Someone's, Karen, did you bring a salad? We got a salad. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Jason, for getting the pizza. <laughs> Sweet. All right. Um, I think that that's it. Great. Great. I'm going to turn things over to Pastor Taylor. Let's worship God. I invite you to remain seated for this first song, um, and then to stand as you're able during the second one. But let's just allow this first one to be um, an opportunity for us to, to breathe, to recognize where we are, to be present to the Holy Spirit's presence among us, and to um, invite the Spirit to move among us in a new way this morning. Um, so I invite you again to remain seated during dwell, and then to stand as you're able as we sing Gather Us In. Let us worship God.
As I was contemplating the nature of confession last night, it struck me that so often our failures to wholly love God, others, and the world are deeply intertwined with a mindset of shame. Shame at its core is a narrative that feeds off of the assumption that you are not enough. And the problem this can cause is that when we ruminate on feelings of shame, we inevitably subject ourselves to a defensive mindset. Shame causes us to worry about our own images and reputations and to protect our vulnerabilities. The tension is that on focusing on how to protect ourselves, we numb ourselves to the experience of true love. Love is inherently risky in nature. Without vulnerability and sacrifice, it becomes tra transactional. And so as we move into our time of confession and reflection, I'd like us to bow our heads and contemplate where shame has paralyzed us to the practice of love this week. And as you do so, I invite you to adopt the posture that shame can make us feel. 
Bow your head low, maybe clench your hands into fists, but let's adopt that posture and ask God to reveal where we have chosen safety rather than sacrifice this week. Let's take some deep breaths together and have a moment of silence. Friends, receive this good news. In the name of Christ, you are completely forgiven. God doesn't flinch at our shortcomings, but receives them with tenderness and grace. And not only that, but Christ has given us a new identity. In him we are called beloved, each and every one of us with all our triumphs and failures, beloved. I'd like us to spend a moment more in silence, but this time I want you to focus on the love that God has for you. Saint Ignatius calls this God's loving gaze. So let's close our eyes again, taking deep breaths and concentrating on God's love for us. But this time I'd like you to try something different. Open up your posture. You can move your shoulders back, open your hands up, tilt your head and look upward. Open yourself up and let's take a moment to receive the love of Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you that there is nothing that can separate us from your love. We ask that you would give us the strength to receive our identity as beloveds. We ask for the strength to receive the belonging that we have been given in your name. So often it is difficult for us to find the strength to receive this because it means becoming vulnerable, means receiving something that we have not ourselves earned. And yet we know that it has been given. We know that we are loved and seen in your name. Would you give us the strength to receive this this morning and to move forward in humble adoration for the good thing that you have done for us. We love you, God. Amen. I'd like to invite you all um, to participate in a moment of silence in between prayers, and then I'll follow with um, in your mercy, and you can respond with hear our prayer. Um, So yeah, this goes, Lord, we pray for people around the world suffering as a result of war, instability, poverty, 
oppressive regimes and persecution. Give them the strength and comfort to live through each day. God, I can't help but think about the people who profit from the suffering of others, filled with pride and greed. May they come to recognize the harm in their actions and the pain they inflict on others. We pray for you to transform them and grant, and grant them with your wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and discernment to foster reconciliation in a world where your love and compassion prevail. And then moment of silence. In your mercy, Lord, there's so much going on in our country right now, from political unrest to people hardly getting by. There are many people filled with anxiety, with the uncertainty these things bring. Teach us to trust in you, O oh Lord, and your assurance of your love and compassion for us. Strengthen our faith and teach us to, bri to be bridge builders with those we're in a disagreement with. Remind us that we're all united in your boundless love and grace. And think of something you'd like to pray in this next moment of silence again. In your mercy, we lift up a prayer um, those in, our, in the Spokane community experiencing homelessness. Comfort and protect them as they live through these difficult circumstances. Provide them with the sustenance they need. Teach us on how to support them in these times and urge us to be compassionate and relentless to help where we can. We lift up members of our congregation facing challenging circumstances. We pray for Jane's brother afflicted with Alzheimer's. We pray for patience and understanding for him and his caregivers as they navigate the challenges of this condition. We also pray for Jane's other brother who is recovering from the aftermath of an ATV accident. Grant him physical and emotional healing. Lord, we pray for Dick and his family as he's going through cancer treatments. Give him the strength and comfort during this time along his wife, Trudy. We also lift up Pat and pray that you may incline your ear to her needs at this time. Along with those people, we also pray for our pastor, Drew, and pray for your discern that you may give him your discernment and wisdom as he stewards this congregation to know and serve you. Lord, we pray that you may empower us to be a source of light and comfort and hope to all those in need. Um, moment of silence. In your mercy, amen. As we offer our prayers to God, knowing that God sees us and knows us more deeply uh, than we could ever comprehend, we also uh, have this opportunity to offer ourselves, to offer our time, 
our tithes, our offerings, recognizing that all we are, all we have, is from God. At Knox, we have the practice of singing the doxology first, which if you only worship here, seems normal to you, but in other uh, worshiping contexts, it's often sung after the offering, but we intentionally include it before as a reminder and a declaration that indeed God is the one from whom all blessings flow, and it's in response to that good news that we give of ourselves. So I invite you to stand as we sing the doxology, and then you may go to the back of the sanctuary, light a candle, um, give of your tithes and offerings of your time, however you are sensing the Spirit inviting you to respond to God's blessing for you today. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise God above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. 
Haggai chapter 2, verse 1 through 9. In the seventh month, seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, son of Shiltel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Is it not in your sight as nothing? Yet take courage, O Zerubbabel, says the Lord. Take courage, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Take courage, O you people of the land, says the Lord. Work, for I am with you, says the Lord of the hosts. According to the promise that I made you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit abides among you, do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once again, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will fill this house with splendor, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The latter splendor of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give prosperity, says the Lord of hosts. Uh, two years ago, is this, or am I on? good? Can you hear me? Uh, two years ago, I was here with you all, and I preached, uh, I, I preached from this text. And parts of this sermon are going to sound familiar if you were here two years ago. So I just want to give you a heads up, and that's intentional. Uh, because of, as Drew and I talked about where you're at as a congregation, and how the Spirit is at work among you, discerning what is next, this seemed like the most appropriate text to preach from. Uh, so for those of you who actually remember what I preached, I apologize if it's repetitive. Let's pray for understanding. Creator God, we are grateful for your living word and that you continue to speak to us through your word. May your spirit open our ears, hearts, and minds to what you have to say to us this morning. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. To give just a bit of background about the text that I chose for this morning, uh, including the one that you just heard, the readings today take place when some of the Israelites are returning from exile, approximately 50 to 70 years prior to these texts, all the Israelite leaders, political and religious, and all those who were considered elite, had been forcefully removed from their homes. They were taken to Babylon, where they were told by the prophet Jeremiah to build a new life, to plant gardens and marry off their children, to seek the good of their city, who also happened to be their captors. And they did that. And now, where the texts pick up, it's 50 years and a few kings later, and they were sent by Cyrus, king of Persia, to go back to Israel and to rebuild their temple. The text tells us that those who felt called by the Spirit returned. Those who did not feel called by the Spirit did not return, but they financially supported those who were going back, and they sent them with their blessing. When they returned to Israel, not much was there. So they had to rebuild everything, not just the temple. The first thing they did was they built an altar where the previous one had been, and they made sacrifices, 
which was a form of worship that they had not been able to participate in for over 50 years. But then, after that, they got distracted and busy rebuilding and settling. You can read the whole book of Ezra. It's pretty short, and it goes into the details of this. Uh, But eventually, it's been 20 years now. So 20 years after that first time of worship, the prophet Haggai, the scripture you just heard, he gets after the people about not having rebuilt the temple yet, only the altar. And then he reminds them of their call to rebuild the temple. So then the people got to work building the temple foundation exactly in the place that it had been prior to being destroyed by the Babylonians. And that is where our text picks up today. And I want you to note from the first text that Angel read for us uh, that Haggai tells them that even though the new temple looks like nothing compared to the first one, that the new temple that will be rebuilt will be even better than the first one. So our next text is Ezra 3, 10 through 13, when the people are gathered to celebrate. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments were stationed to praise the Lord with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, according to the directions of King David of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people responded with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites, the heads of families, old people, who had seen the first house on its foundations, they wept with a loud voice when they saw this house, though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted so loudly that the sound was heard far away. This is the word of the Lord. I want to tell, as an introduction to this, a bit of history and story about your um, neighbors, Bethany, the Bethany congregation that you share space with. Uh, They used to be located down by the freeway right off the Freya exit, and uh, years ago, over a decade, it was probably 15 years ago, um, the Department of Transportation purchased their building in order to Uh, expand the freeway and prepare for the north-south freeway. So they had to leave their building. The upside was they got a really nice check for that. So it was, even though they were sad to leave their building and the place where they established their congregation, uh, it was okay because they got some money to go find something different. Then they shared space with a Lutheran church for several years um, while they discerned what was next for them. And then they purchased the building that's on Ray and 27th on the South Hill. No one really liked that building, but it was available and it worked and they were able to pay for it so that they didn't have a mortgage payment. And they made it work and it was their space. And they had a third floor in that building that had never been finished. And they began conversations with World Relief about whether they could transform that space into housing for refugees before they found more permanent housing. And so they were in these conversations, and then in January of 22, there was a fire, and their alarm system didn't work, wasn't up to date, so the fire destroyed the building. Uh, And so then they were homeless, and this was right, they'd only been meeting after COVID for I think a month, maybe two months, so they had gone without meeting in person for nearly two years. They finally started meeting and then their building was destroyed. So then they started meeting in the community space across the street and they began to wonder, are we gonna make it through this? Uh, This is a lot. COVID, uh, the building burning, what are we gonna do? And they began a discernment process that they invited me into and they began wondering, they, and you know, all of during this, and they're still doing this, dealing with insurance to f- try to figure out what insurance will cover. 
And so they began looking at the different various possibilities. They could restore the building exactly to what it was before, a building that none of them liked and that didn't seem very practical for what they actually use it for. They could sell the whole site uh, and see if they had enough money to buy a different place to meet that was more practical for their needs. Or this other idea came up about, well, what if we just knock the whole thing down and we built housing and also built a space for us to meet? And the session, the more they looked into all of these options, sensed that that was where the spirit was leading them. Uh, and, and so then they brought it to the congregation. And it was a bit surprising the first time the congregation heard about that. So then they had to do some work with the congregation to discern together. Is this just the session that's discerning this, or are we as a congregation discerning this? And I think you probably know, because they're meeting in your space, and maybe you visit with them, that they did decide last December and voted with 100% uh, of people who voted, voted in favor of pursuing building housing with uh, an attached, sort of like a condo is what they call it. They, they'll have their own sanctuary space that is theirs to use as they please. But this has been a difficult journey for them. This has not been easy. Um, and it wasn't easy for everyone in the congregation to get on board. So I think I wanted to share that story a little bit because I know that you all are having conversations about what to do with your building and how best to steward it. And you haven't had a fire. So, um, and Bethany would say, they have said, you know, nobody would wish for the fire, but it did expedite things for them. It did force them to make decisions that they might not have made without that. And so they would say, most of them, that even though they wouldn't choose that, they're grateful for where it's brought them today. So back to the, let's look back at this text, Ezra 3. So this group has finally built, after 20 years of being back in their home, they finally built the temple foundation. And then they all gathered to worship and celebrate, and the text tells us that many of the priests and Levites, the old people, who had seen the first house on its foundation, they wept with a loud voice when they saw this house. And then the prophet Haggai confirms that from our first reading, saying, who is left among you that saw this house in its former glory? Is it not in your sight as nothing? All they had built was the foundation of the temple, not even the walls, but it was already clear that the new temple would be nothing compared to the old one. Now remember, the old one, the first temple, was built by Solomon with nearly limitless resources. So you can imagine the difference between that temple and a temple built under Babylonian rule with whatever resources they were willing to spare. The text tells us that those who were weeping were the ones who remembered the old temple. So they were at least 70, 80 years old. These are people who had spent their entire lives longing for the temple worship and life that they remembered. The temple that formed their faith. The temple that they hoped would form the faith of generations to come. And they likely romanticized it, and their memory may have distorted it over time. They forgot their failings that led to the Babylonians destroying it. But also the new temple foundation was very different from the first one. So different that just seeing it was disappointing enough to bring them to tears. They realized that what they had hoped for and remembered would never be again. And they were mourning that loss. And I imagine that that text might hit pretty close to home for you here at Knox. When I preached this sermon two years ago, I used this text as a metaphor about how the church in North America is changing and how different it is than it was during the height of Christendom when all of our buildings were full and programs were exploding with children. But at this point, your congregation is talking about literally 
knocking your building down and putting something new in its place, housing with a sanctuary. I imagine that many of you might identify with the elders in this passage who looked at the new temple and mourned the temple that formed their faith. You might look at the architectural drawings as they come up and the same way that the elders looked at the temple foundation. Because this building has been the place where your faith was formed, the place where you came weekly for community and to grow in faith, and you can't imagine it not being here in its current form. The first temple was knocked down by enemies in our text. The elders did not have control over that. For some of you, you can't imagine voting to have it knocked down. That feels very different than someone else destroying it or a fire like the Bethany congregation experienced. However, you have come to a point where you cannot simply go on as if nothing has changed. You've been able to do that for many years here at Knox, many years longer than you thought you could when you first changed models into, uh, you changed models, was it 20 years ago or so, more? Um, of how you don't have a, a full-time pastor and you, the congregation does a lot more of the work. Um, you've been able to sustain that for a long time. But you've now come to a point where you will need to make some difficult and big decisions. And not making a decision is actually making a decision. The world around us is changing at a faster pace than we can keep up with. And some of us really wish that the church could be the one thing that didn't change. But the building is not the church, and the church is not God. You, the people, are the church. As part of the Reformed faith, we believe that God does not change. God is steady. God is faithful. God is dependable. But God does call us to continue reforming and changing. And that will require us to be open to things that look really different than what we're, what we're used to. And I think the first step is to acknowledge what this church and building have been for this community. The good that has happened in this place. The lives that have been transformed and shaped because of this place. And if we feel sad that it will look different in the future, it's okay for us to admit that and to mourn that loss. In fact, I don't think you can move forward until you acknowledge that loss. Sort of like you can't move through all the stages of grief if you get stuck in the denial stage. However, the Israelites did not let the weeping and the mourning stop their work. They were still called to complete the new temple. They didn't stop when the elders wept and said it didn't look the same. In fact, they didn't even allow the weeping and the mourning to take over the crowd. The mourning was present and accepted in the crowd, alongside the shouts for joy and the excitement over something new. And it's possible that the elders themselves experienced mixed emotion both mourning and joy at the same time, mourning that it didn't look the same, but joy that something was being built. They didn't tear down the foundation and start over and try to make it look exactly like it did before because they knew that would be impossible. Instead, they moved forward with God's call knowing that it would look different than it did before. It had to because they were different. They had different resources, and it was a different time. I think it's also important to acknowledge that those who were shouting for joy allowed others to mourn, that both gave space for one another. So those of us who are excited for the possibilities of something different and new need to allow space for those who are mourning, those for whom this building has shaped and changed their life. We need to be in that together. Going forward, your church is going to look different no matter what decisions you make. 
you're a different and smaller group of people with very different resources than you had 60 years ago. There is no going back to what this church once was. Just like the Israelites had to faithfully rebuild a temple that looked different from the first one, we are called to faithfully join God's work building the kingdom, even and especially when it looks different than anything we've seen or experienced before. As the Israelite elders wept and mourned over the new temple foundation, what they didn't know was what would happen in this new temple that they were building. They didn't know that this would be the temple where Jesus, the Messiah, would be dedicated. The temple where 12-year-old Jesus would get left behind by his family and they would find him sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking questions. This is the temple where God wouldn't just be present in the Holy of Holies, but would actually walk the temple courts and teach in human form. The temple where Jesus would eventually turn over tables and anger the religious elite to the point of having him killed. The temple where upon Jesus' death, the curtain dividing the Holy of Holies would be torn, opening up the presence of God to all the people. The elders weeping couldn't imagine what would happen there in the future. All they could see was that it didn't look like the temple of the past. And some of you can't imagine what could happen here in the future that could be better than what happened in the past. However, there are also a group of people here that are sensing a nudge of the spirit to build something new and see what happens. They hope that something beyond their wildest dreams could happen in the new thing that is built, something that only God can imagine. So as you continue these conversations and this discernment work, here at Knox, may you trust what the prophet Haggai said, that the latter splendor of this house shall be greater than the former. May we believe that even as the church changes and looks different, that the spirit is at work doing more than we can possibly imagine. Amen. Before we sing our song of response, take my life and let it be, I'm just going to read um, the song that uh, was played during offering as our prayer of response to the word that Giddy has brought to us today. God, you have given all to us. To you, O oh Lord, we return it. Everything we have is yours. Do with it what you will. You will gather all of each of us, every gift, every burden, every day, every hour. Do with it what you will. We will take up our daily cross every step of the journey. We'll bear it together for your sake. Do with it what you will. Take our laughter and our loss. Make them tools for your mercy. Anything our hands can make, do with it what you will. stand as you're able as we sing together take my life take my life and let it be consecrated lord to thee take my moments and my days let them flow in ceaseless praise let them flow in ceaseless praise take my and let them move at the impulse. 
lips and let them be filled with messages from thee filled with messages from thee doesn't change. At this table, we are welcomed by the Lord. It is not our table here at Knox. It is the Lord's table, and we are invited to come, to be nourished for our journey ahead, to be remembered as a body, being brought together in community. Anyone who trusts in Jesus is welcome at this table. Let us pray. God, we thank you that no matter where we are, you are with us and you never change. Your love is steadfast and you always desire and give to us what is good. We thank you that this is evident at this table here in these simple elements of bread and juice, these reminders of your presence with us and the kind of presence that that is, a presence that doesn't just look out for us or look over us, but that dwells among us in our everyday needs, our suffering, our highs, our lows. You are the God who came to us as a human being. You, Jesus, are the one who gave your body who gave your very self for us and for the world, that we might know your unending and unchanging love. So, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come and be among these elements, among this bread and this wine, this juice, that you would make them for us, the body and blood of Christ, as we are remembered into Christ's body in the world today. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are with us, that you feed us through this meal, you bring us to the presence of the Father, and that you send us out renewed and remembered and fed as your people, as your hands and feet, Jesus, in this world. Amen. On the night of his arrest at the Last Supper, Jesus, I think, was probably full of some sadness. And some of his disciples didn't get it. <laughs> they, they came to the table with maybe a little more joy and just enjoying the Passover meal. But there was a mix of emotions in the room. And on that night, Jesus took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. So whenever you eat this bread, remember me. And in the same way, later, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. So whenever you drink this cup, remember me. So whenever we eat this bread and we drink this cup, 
we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. I want to invite the servers to come forward as well as um, those who will receive communion first. They're telling me what I need to do as we go here. So first to our virtual friends. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. So those of you at home, this is the body of Christ, which is given for you. When you eat of it, remember Jesus. And this is the saving blood of Jesus, which is also shed for you. Amen.
God, thank you that at this table all are fed, that you are the host who always welcomes us home, who sends us out to share your love and the truth of your good news in a world in need. Thank you for these gifts of these elements, for the gifts of the people in this room, for the gift of your presence among us, Holy Spirit, that we are not alone, that we are indeed beloved, and we get to share the good news of that love, wherever it is you may call us. Amen. Friends, as you are able, I invite you to stand as we sing our sending song, Dare to Live the Dream God Gives You. Before Katie gives our benediction, uh, we need to thank someone. Jude Richley has been our summer fellow this whole summer, um, has preached for us, has provided leadership during worship uh, almost every single Sunday, and even more than that, has just blessed us by being who he is. Jude, we are very thankful to have had the kind of relationship with you that we've had this summer. And we're very thankful that this isn't goodbye, despite the fact that this is your last Sunday as our official summer fellow. Um, Jude, uh, Jude's parents, Steve and Michelle, are here. Very thankful for the kind of young man that you have raised and for the kind of parents that you are for being able to be here. Uh, they're going to drive back to Beaverton later on today. Um, so before you do that, Jude, I wonder if you could come down here Sorry, I did not prepare you for this. Um, Jason, where's Jason? Jason's getting pizzas. Jason's a servant, and as a servant, um, took care of um, getting you something there, and Karen, who was right here, also took care of getting you a card in there. This is from all of us, and we're very, very thankful for you. Um, I'd like to pray for you, 
And as we do that, I'm going to invite you all to extend your hands outwards towards Jude uh, as we pray kind of the sending prayer as he goes on a little break for the summer before he comes back. We pray for you. Gracious God, thank you for Jude. Thank you for the gifts that you have given him and all the beautiful ways that he was able to share them with our friends and partners in ministry at Side by Side and for us right here at Knox. Lord, as Jude goes out from here, as he continues to learn more and more the ways that you have set for him to grow, we ask that he go with your grace, he go with your protection, and that he go with your spirit of curiosity to continue to learn all of your beautiful and mysterious ways. We thank you, gracious God, for Jude and for the love that you have shown through him. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So now as we all go from this place to have a conversation, but even beyond that, go back into our everyday lives, may we make space for one another while some are grieving and sh some are shouting for joy. May the Spirit guide us in discernment as we move forward with God's call, whatever that may be. And now to him who by the power is at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly more than we can ask or imagine. To God be the glory in the church, in Christ Jesus, to all the generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's go eat some pizza. We're heading downstairs. We're going to be having some conversation, but let's just start eating first. So let's head on down to the fellowship hall. <laughs>